Hello. I think she's facing some technical difficulties. Yeah. yeah. Her voice is coming through. Her video Hello. is not. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Can you introduce video the next speaker, please? Video is not starting. So I can. That's all right, ma'am. You can yeah, go ahead yeah. and speak. We can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, this is really a very uh, good academic feast. And Dr. Pratik Tambe, when he asked me whether he will join it, I was so elated. And uh, uh, speakers are uh, really uh, just now, uh, Dr. Charmila has elaborated so much about the uh, FGR compared to HGA. And we really came to know so many points and uh, the Doppler studies of the FGR fetus. And now I have to introduce Dr. Priti Kumar. Uh, she is the co-chair, maternal and perinatal committee, SAFOG, chairperson, Safe Motherhood Committee, FOXI, committee member, FMM committee, AOFOG, professor and head department of obstetric and gynae, Narada Institute of Medical Sciences, Kanpur. And she was organizing secretary, UPCOG 2023 Lucknow and AICOG 2020 Lucknow, Gestosis 2019, IAGE 2018, NZYF 2017 Lucknow. She is the Vice President Lucknow of Tetic and Gynic Societies 2020-22, Core Member of Prevention of Violence Against Women and Cell of Foxy. 2021 and 23 and 2018 to 20. Recipient of Shining Star Award from Lucknow of Tetic and Gynic Society. Recipient of Women Healthcare Award from Leading Print Media. Recipient of the Padma Bhushan Kamlawai Hospital Award. I think Award. Dr. Shatal, just we can skip this introduction. Yeah, let, let, let the audience come to know what all you have <laughs> achieved. <laughs> yeah, just one or two. In, yeah. uh, in charge center of skill enhancement, Krishna Medical Center, Lucknow, and appreciation award by health minister, awarded woman inspiration award by Inner Field Club. And uh, you, yeah, you know, you can start. Yeah, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Dr. Preeti, yeah. for gracing the occasion. It's always a privilege <laughs> to have you with us on thank this so experience thank series you. platform. And you are world recognized as one of the important thought leaders from India. In fact, you've contributed to so many national organizations and international organizations, including UNICEF, Japaigo. We have over 800 people in the audience at last count who are waiting so with bated breath to listen to you. Over to you. Thank you so much, Pratik. Thank you so much, Dr. Shanta. Can I share my presentation? Please go ahead. Can you see the slides? Yes, ma'am. We can see it. Go ahead. Okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Shanta and Dr. Pratik, for the kind introduction. And after listening to the talk of Dr. Charbila on fetal growth restriction, I'm going to cover on the iron deficiency anemia, not the entire anemia, but definitely the noble molecule in the management of iron deficiency anemia. The, the presentation has been based on the Anemia Mukta Bharat training tool, which has been recently revised by Government of India in 2019. And as you can see, the NHFS5 data, there are a lot of states in India where the prevalence of anemia has risen, like Sikkim, Gujarat, Assam. These are some of the states where there had been increase in the prevalence of anemia in pregnant in 15 to 49 years uh, of uh, uh, females. Now, these are the very important, uh, you know, uh, points which have been included in Anemia Mukta Bharat training tool in 2019. One was the delayed cord clamping. Initially, Government of India endorsed 100 milligram. Now, it has been switched to 60 milligram of elemental iron in prophylactic and therapeutic doses. Mandating use of fortified food in public health programs. A special focus on double fortified salt like iodine and iron and using invasive digital methods of hemoglobin estimation at point of care. And most of the public health facilities uh, of the government are having point of care devices, but whichever test you are using, you have to estimate the hemoglobin level. And now intravenous uh, ferric carboxymaltose and IV iron sucrose has been included in the management of moderate and severe anemia. Now, I just want to highlight some of the observations that we made as a Safe Motherhood Committee. We did a survey of 1900 OBGYNs of a country, and they were 1500 were almost the postgraduates, 
uh, beyond, you know, they, they are all uh, specialist uh, OBGYNs and 300 were almost the postgraduates who participated in this uh, survey. So surprisingly, I just want to read out the highlights. 88.7% of the OBGYN screen anemia only in the first trimester. That is fine enough, but still 12 to 13% do not screen in the first trimester. 53% of the OBGYNs perform CVC along with the RBC indices and 50% only, you know, stick to hemoglobin estimation. Majority of the OBGYNs estimate hemoglobin thrice during antenatal period, which is again, not sufficient. 50% of the OBGYNs do not consider thalassemia screening routinely and deworming regularly. Major Majority of them prefer low-dose iron and 59% prefer to use 100 milligram of oral iron daily. Almost half of the OBGYNs prefer to change iron salt when patients do not respond to oral. Again, this was a surprising, you know, uh, evidence from the survey that they change the salt rather than, you know, shifting to IV instead of escalating the injectable iron. Interestingly, 52% of the OBGYNs evaluate ferritin levels before starting intravenous iron. So half of the OBGYNs start, are starting giving IV iron without estimating the ferritin levels. And 53.5% perform hemoglobin estimation as early as two weeks after IV iron therapy. Now, as we are aware about the fact that the total iron requirement during pregnancy increases, to almost 1,000 to 1,200 milligram, not going into much of the details. And there are various classifications, how you classify the hemoglobin levels according to the severity, mild, moderate, severe. But I want to stick to this one, that is ICMR. Uh, and you must, you know, uh, emphasize here that the normal hemoglobin in a pregnant woman should be more than or equal to 11 gram, not less than that. So whenever we do a survey, most of the OBGYNs write less than 10 gram. So the first take home message is that the hemoglobin level in the pregnant woman should be more than or equal to 11 gram. Mild is 10 to 10.9 because it is important to remember these figures because I'll be elaborating mild, moderate, severe and the management. Moderate is 7 to 9.9. .9. Less than 7 is severe and less than 4 or 5 is very severe. So these, you know, numbers are important. Mild is 10 to 10.9. Moderate is 7 to 9.9, .9, severe is less than 7, and very severe is less than 4. So for the diagnosis, it is important to assess the severity of anemia, then type of anemia. Assessment of iron stores are very important. Assessment of heat and iron and assessment of iron absorption. So to assess the severity of anemia, hemoglobin estimation along with the CBC should be done in each and every patient. And you should also ask for the typing of anemia that is through RBC indices. Now, if you have a low hemoglobin, suppose if the hemoglobin level is less than 11, the second thing that you need to test is the complete blood count and peripheral Hello. Hello. Am I audible? I lost connection. Yes, ma'am. No. Yes, ma'am. Go so ahead. Now, Go ahead. Now, so the, the important thing to understand is microcytic hypochromic more than 100. So I'll stick my presentation to microcytic hypochromic. And if you see the right hand corner, that is the microcytic hypochromic, remember ticks. Ticks is, is a mnemonic that you can use. T stands for thalassemia, I stands for iron deficiency anemia, C stands for chronic anemia of chronic disease, and S stands for sideroblastic anemia. So if you remember these, this mnemonic, you will be able to understand that what are the causes of microcytic anemia, because our talk will be focused on microcytic hypochromic anemia. Now, when you talk about the RBC indices, thalassemia and iron deficiency anemia have a similar picture almost. So if you if you find a GBP, you can see a iron deficiency anemia, you see microcytic hypochromic. Then you ask for the hemoglobin electrophoresis and HbA12 is more than 3.5, then it's a case of thalassemia. Again, it is important to understand, I'll show you one of the slides. In thalassemia, since the iron content is not low, the counts are normal. Most, most of the times the counts are normal. But in iron deficiency anemia, if you see the RBC count, that will be low, despite of and other, other features of MCV and FCV, which will be very much reduced. So let us see this picture. If you can see this, the hemoglobin is 8.8. .8, but if you see the RBC count, it is 4.84. 
So the RBC count here is normal, but still, if you see the MCV, it is quite low, 63. The normal MCV I just now mentioned in a microcytic, it should be less than 80. So it is 63.8. So here, since the count is normal, hemoglobin is less. And MCV, is, this could be a, a case of, and GPB shows a microcytic hypochromic, this hmm. could be a case of thalassemia. So this patient requires a electrophoresis and hemoglobin electrophoresis to rule out thalassemia. So looking at the blood picture is very, very important, which we usually skip and we read only the hemoglobin level. Now, similarly, I'm showing you the other picture. Here, the hemoglobin level is 11.4, if you can see, but look at the indices. The MCH, MCV, and these are all almost on the lower end. And RDW is raised in iron deficiency anemia. So these are the pictures, even though the hemoglobin is in the normal range. But if you do the ferritin level, the ferritin level was less, that is 10. So normal ferritin level should be more than 30. So it's very important to differentiate. Even with the normal hemoglobin, the patient can be iron deficient. So it is very important when you read a uh, blood report, read the RBC indices, which will give you the correct picture. Now to differentiate between the inflammation, thalassemia, iron deficiency and sideroblastic anemia, the most important one is the ferritin level. So in thalassemia, you will find that the uh, iron ferritin level is high. And even in the chronic inflammation, the ferritin level will be very high. So the next step, if you want to really diagnose, would be the ferritin level instead of doing all other tests. So one is you rule out thalassemia first and foremost, and then do the ferritin levels. Important to understand is that the serum ferritin concentration forms the most accurate diagnostic test in patients without underlying inflammation. So if there is an underlying inflammation, then ferritin will not be an adequate marker for iron deficiency anemia. Now, this is a very important step when we did this survey. Most of the VGYs, the person were not, you know, deverifying the patient. Every pregnant woman should be given a deworming tablet that is albendazole in the second trimester as early as 14 to 16 weeks of uh, gestation. So this is a part of Anemia Mukta Bharat program and we should, you know, incorporate this in our practice. But if, if hookworm hi is highly endemic and the prevalence is high, then repeat the anti-helmetic after 12 weeks of the first dose. Now, coming to the prophylaxis, uh, again, important, which we usually miss. If a, if any woman of a reproductive age group comes to you, please do write uh, a prophylactic dose of iron. You can give them a prophylactic dose. This is a recommendation by uh, Anemia Mukta Bharat, Prathan Mantri, Anemia Mukta Bharat program, that each tablet containing 60 milligram of elemental iron and 500 microgram of folic acid should be given weekly to these patients. But when you talk about the pregnancy, the prophylactic dose is now 60 milligram of elemental iron and 500 milligram microgram of folic acid for 180 days. Initially, in earlier guidelines, it was 100 days. Now it has been shifted to change to 180 days. Similarly, for lactating women, the prophylactic dose is 60 mm -hmm. milligram elemental iron with 500 mi microgram of folic acid. Uh, and they should be given for 180 days. Again, important to understand that iron should be given in morning hours because of the hepcidin levels. Hepcidin levels show diurnal variation and iron if given in the morning hours when with hepcidin level low leads to higher absorption. So when you want to treat iron deficiency anemia, it is according to the gestational age and severity of anemia. You can give oral iron, parenteral and blood transfusion. Today's talk is on parental iron, so I'll just skip, uh, put a few points on oral therapy and then I'll come to the IV iron. So oral iron, it is important to counsel the patient and the healthcare worker should be aware about how to give oral iron because they are the people who usually counsel the pregnant women when they are there in the clinic. So it should be taken between the meals. Avoid consumption with tea, coffee or milk. Start with low dose to decrease the side effect. And change their brand if it is intolerable. But if it, if the patient is not pregnant, woman is not responding to iron, it is better to shift to IV iron. So these are all iron preparations. We are not going into detail. There are no such study which proves that this iron is better to other. But these are all, you know, the iron preparations which are available in the market. Now, coming to the therapeutic dose, I have talked about the prophylactic. The therapeutic dose is same. That is uh, 60 milligram of elemental iron and 500 microgram of folic acid twice daily. For prophylactic, it is if the hemoglobin is more than 11, the prophylactic dose is given. But if the hemoglobin is less than 11, then it should be given twice daily for 180 days. 
the causes of poor failure of oral therapy is poor patient compliance, malabsorption syndrome, presence of chronic infection, or continuous loss of iron. These are all causes. I'm not going into detail, but this is very, very important chart. I, I will request everyone to please download it from the Anemia Mukta Bharat program. And uh, this chart, you should place it in your clinic. Starting from the extreme of right, if a hemoglobin is less than five, for every gestational age, it is blood transfusion. Remember that it is blood transfusion. But if it is between, I told you that severe anemia is less than seven is severe anemia. So if the hemoglobin is between five to seven, the next step is see the gestational age. If gestational age is less than 34, then give her IV iron. If gestational age is more than 34, again, blood transfusion. So for severe anemia, less than five, all trimester, you have to give blood transfusion. For severe anemia between 5 to 7, look at the gestational age. If it is less than 34, then you can give IV iron. If it is more than 34, then you have to give blood transfusion. Now, coming to mild to moderate anemia, if the gestational age is less than 34 and patient is compliant, then you have to give two tablets of iron folic acid and then you have to check the improvement after one month. So if the rise of hemoglobin is more than or equal to one gram, then you have to continue it for two months. And then once the hemoglobin is normal, you shift it to prophylactic dose. But if the rise is not more than one gram, then you have to refer it to the higher center or look for the other causes why the patient is not responding. Now, if a case there, she's a case of mild to moderate anemia and gestational age is more than 34, then it is better to give parental iron because these patients are nearer to the term and you need a faster rise in the hemoglobin. Again, if the gestational age is less than 34 and patient is not responding to your twice a dose of oral, then you have to switch over to the iron. Please do not change the brand. It is important to understand that you now need to put her on IV iron because she's iron deficient. And again, check for hemoglobin rise. If it is, you can do it after two weeks or maybe three weeks, whatever is the protocol. If the rise is more than one gram, then and she achieves a full dose of total dose iron therapy, then there is no further need for prophylactic iron. This is very important. Once you have given a total dose iron in a pregnant woman, calculated by Ganzoni's formula, then there is no further need of prophylactic iron therapy in these patients. Now, coming to the IV iron, uh, what are the indications um, I have already talked about? But when oral iron is not tolerated or patient is non-compliant or there is no improvement in the hemoglobin despite your oral therapy, then you have to switch over to the IV. Contraindications, especially you have to be very careful if the patient is having hep any hepatic problem, then you have to be very careful giving IV iron doses. Then patient with evidence of iron overload, patient with known hypersensitivity, Patient with anemia not caused by iron deficiency, liver disorders, jaundice, cirrhosis and renal failure and acute cardiac failure and known cases of thalassemia. So what are the prerequisites for parental iron therapy? Important thing is advocate supervision. You have to admit the patient. Stop oral iron at least 24 hours prior to therapy to avoid toxic reaction. And sensitivity is tested. It was recommended for earlier, you know, iron brands, but it is not required for iron sucrose, FCM or isomotocyte, which is a new molecule. And you have to watch for the reactions. Now, these are the comparative charts for iron sucrose and ferric carboxymaltose because after this, I'm coming to iron isomaltoside. The dose of iron sucrose is normally 20 milligram per ml and it is important to understand that please do not give more than 200 milligram in one setting. These are the government of India guidelines and the maximum dose of iron sucrose that can be given is 600 milligram. So in a week. So this is the maximum dose of iron sucrose that can be given. It is category B and now ferric carboxymaltose is also considered to be as category B. The important thing with FCM is that it leads to hypophosphatemia and sometimes the blood pressure may be raised, but definitely iron FCM, you can give a better higher dose as compared to iron sucrose in one setting. Again, important to notice, this is a Ganzoni formula. Here you should know how, to, how much iron to be given, IV iron to be given. So you have to calculate the total dose of iron. This is derived by 2.4 into target hemoglobin. Here target hemoglobin is not 14. Here the target hemoglobin is 11. And minus the actual hemoglobin, suppose the actual hemoglobin right now is 10. So target hemoglobin is 11 minus 10 into pre-pregnancy weight, whatever is the pre-pregnancy weight, 
plus it is not 1000 milligram it is 500 milligram so now the government of india has given this formula to calculate the total dose of iron so this is how you calculate the total dose of iron you give total dose of iron and then you need not to again start prophylactic iron a very beautiful chart which is given i know it is cl little cluttered but definitely there is a very good chart where it mentions about the weight and how much you know iron can be given to this patient straight away you can calculate from this chart now for iron sucrose again uh, it is important that 200 mg should be given in one dose and then it should not be repeated uh, should not exceed a dose of 600 mg in one week initially the drop should be less maybe 20 to 30 drops these are all from government of india guidelines and then it should be increased to 80 to 90 again you should give iv iron as early as possible up to a period of 20 to 25 minutes now coming to the various generation of iron iv iron which have been introduced now we talk about the second generation iron sucrose most of the public facilities are still using iron sucrose because uh, maybe the government medical colleges have fcm but most of the cscs and pscs are still having using iron sucrose and third generation, what we are going to talk about is iron maltoside, which is a new molecule uh, in the armamentarium of the air. So, uh, important to understand is why these terminologies are given. Every parental iron is complex with the carbohydrate moiety. So the iron molecule is in the between and it is, for, it is surrounded by the carbohydrate shell. And more stronger, there is a binding between the carbohydrate shell and the iron molecule. More stronger is the complex, more safer is the parental iron because it will release lesser labile iron. So whatever reactions happen in a person is because of the labile iron. More labile iron is free, is free irons are released in the circulation, more patients will have more toxicity. So I3, a new molecule in the armamentarium, a very important to understand. I3 stands for IV intravenous. I again stands for uh, iron dose in iron deficiency anemia. So I3 consists of iron and carbohydrate shell, which is isomaltoside. In iron sucrose, it is sucrose. In ferric carboxymaltose, it is carbo uh, carboxymaltose. So carbohydrate by moiety is very important, which is tightly bound to the matrix structure. And this enables a controlled and slow release of iron to iron binding proteins, avoiding potential toxicity from release of labile uh, iron. So these are the studies which have been published in American Journal of uh, Hematology. And there they have evaluated the labile iron dose and as you can see the the labile iron is minimum in iron isomaltoside now the best thing about iron maltoside is you can give even administer higher doses in one sitting so even if you're giving a fcm sometimes people you know calculate the total dose and they give it in two sittings but uh, for IV uh, isomaltoside, that is I3, it can be given uh, uh, straight away 50, at as high as 1500 milligram. You can give it in one sitting. So uh, I3 is uh, isomaltoside uh, is a third generation IV iron. It was introduced in Europe, DCGI approved, and it is approved by US FDA also. The important thing is uh, it goes through the reticuloendothelial system and from there it is binds to the protein and then replaces the iron stores. Now coming to some of the evidences, these are studies, some of the studies which have been done. Uh, this was an iron sucrose versus isomaltoside in 1512 patients of gastrointestinal and gynecological blood loss. Here, as you can see, uh, iron sucrose required more visits. As I mentioned, you can only give 200 milligram of iron sucrose. If you're giving more than 200 milligram, please don't give because it is not recommended. You have to give 200 milligram only in one sitting and not more than 600 milligram in one week. For iron maltoside, you can give it in one visit. And the best part is if you see the hemoglobin rise, it was much more in isomaltoside as compared to iron sucrose. And the hemoglobin responders, which were where the rise was more than 2 gram, were higher in isomaltoside group 32.6% as compared to iron sucrose. Now, this is another study, again, a randomized trial, which was done in all the patients of gynecology, oncology, and gastroenterology. And here also, uh, they have seen that if you compare these two and the patient were also compliant to it. 
the important thing to note is we usually don't observe, but after giving FCM, patients do complain of lethargy, weakness, and fatigue. So this is because of the hypophosphatemia. FCM, even in one sitting, causes fibroblast growth factor, which leads to reduce phosphorus levels and vitamin D levels, and re which reduce the uh, calcium absorption leading to hypophosphatemia. So this is how uh, this is reduced. The vitamin D level is re reduced. The calcium levels are reduced and therefore the parathyroid hormone increases and this causes increased excretion of phosphates in urine and this results to general weakness, fatigue and respiratory depression. So these are the two trials which have been given, uh, which have been done comparing FCM with I3. And there they have mentioned, as you can see both the charts, the phosphate levels uh, were much lower until 14 days and then uh, they recovered. So the phosphate levels drop when you give FCM and which is not so in I3. So uh, the 10 times higher incidence of hypophosphatemia with FCM as compared to I3. There, are, there have been no changes in vitamin D and calcium hemostasis with iron isomaltoside. This has been established in various studies and it has been, you know, used in various conditions like ops and gynae, chronic diseases, kidney diseases, inflammatory bowel diseases, cardiology, oncology, and perioperative care. So some of these studies are here now. All three drugs are category B, but I must mention iron isomaltoside can be safely given in postpartum period, but for antenatal, Government of India has still not recommended, but it is DCGI approved for use in IV iron uh, deficiency. So these are several studies which have been done. Just want to quote that high doses of 1500 milligrams is safe in pregnancy it it is 20 these are you know 21 prospective trials including 8000 pregnant women receiving iron isomaltoside and iron sucrose and here they have tested for severity either sensitivity and rise the risk of serious and severe hypersensitivity reactions was lower in isomaltoside as compared to fcm this is another study which has been done in 213 pregnant women from second trimester onward giving us things. So this is what we are, why we are not able to, you know, fight anemia. So it is better even uh, as far as the giving IV iron earlier as compared to oral will give a better outcome, better maternal outcome, better fetal outcome. So these results suppose the convenience, safety and efficacy of single high dose IV iron infusion of isomaltoside for iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia during pregnancy. There are studies for postpartum. Uh, they have been studied in postpartum hemorrhage fatigue syndrome, where after postpartum patients complain of severe fatigue. So a shot of isomaltoside I3 had been given in these patients and they have found that the response was much, much better and the outcome was much better as compared to other uh, IV and oral preparations. So uh, the treatment with higher doses of isomaltoside also causes an increase in the milk secretion, iron in the milk secretion, which was much less as compared to oral. So uh, if you give a IV iron isomaltoside in postpartum period, this will improve the iron content in the milk also. So uh, this can be very safely used in the postpartum period. And these are very recent studies which I've taken from 2020 to 2022. Uh, they, they, they have mentioned that in a pregnancy, you can use beyond uh, first trimester and this gives a faster, you know, compliance and better compliance in these patients and the length of the hospital admission surgery and RBC transfusion reduced. Uh, this is another study which is published in 2023, which says that isomaltoside has been evaluated for the treatment of anemia during pregnancy, including iron deficiency anemia following postpartum hemorrhage, but the safety data is not ensured for the first trimester. So it should be used beyond second and third trimester. The results supposed a convenient safety and efficacy of single high dose I3 infusion for iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia during pregnancy. And in this, they have enrolled 250 patients. So to summarize, IV iron uh, use in women and reproductive age is increasing rapidly. And we should, you know, start thinking of replenishing the iron stores by IV route rather than giving oral because oral gives, uh, you know, especially in pregnant women, because this gives a better rise and the compliant is be much better if you give one shot. So, so I3 is only IV iron that can be given in thousand or maybe more doses in single visit. It has a faster and higher hemoglobin rise as compared to other IV iron. No test dose is required. 
possibility of providing full dose iron repletion in single infusion, then you need not to replenish oral iron. In clinical and observation studies, no acute anaphylactic or delayed allergic reactions are observed. So I3 isomaltoside uh, is safe, effective, and convenient. So thank you so much for patient hearing. If there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you, Prateek, once again. Thank you very much, ma'am, for that wonderful talk. I think you covered so much of anemia in such a short time, and especially the government regulations, the GUI guidelines, and the newer molecules that are now available. Is Dr. Shanta there? Madam, any remarks from you? Yes, sir. Any comments you have regarding the presentation? Please feel free to speak. Yeah, this uh, Dr. Priti. Uh, you are really highly and uh, in a very competitive manner uh, uh, told about the, all three types of iron and especially the iron isomaltoside, which has got uh, very uh, little adverse effects and can be used safely in third trimester of pregnancy. And now this is one of the uh, anemia Mukta Bharat program. And uh, yeah, I congratulate you for elaboration on this uh, iron therapy. And uh, this was a really very, very informative session for all of you and even for me. And I really thanks uh, Dr. Priti Kumar for her great work. Arul, sir, any comment? Uh, <clears throat> do we have time to dilate upon this topic? or We, we have plenty like of time. time. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, see, I have been always uh, curious about uh, this disease, what we call as iron deficiency anemia. And when we say 70% of women of India are anemic, that means 70% women are ill. Now, what community would you consider good if 70% of people are not healthy? And that is why I have uh, elaborated on this at number of places that what we have accepted as anemia of uh, say less than 10 or what Dr. Preeti is saying less than 11 is maybe the Western world criteria. And the Southeast Asia studies from Thailand, from Cambodia, which have come up where they have studied 8 to 10 gram group, even from adolescent age, and they have found that the uh, IQ levels, the locomotor functions, the speed functions, finer movements, in all this, they, they have performed equally well as those who have more than 10 grams. Okay. I studied the resident doctors in my own department. And I found that almost 50% of them had less hemoglobin. All of them were aware that iron works, still they were not taking. So can we push this on the patients when our own colleagues who are well aware, known, and still they, do, they are not taking. So there are issues. And then we have uh, found this as a quick fix solution. And I agree that in pregnancy, we need a quick fix solution. But for the entire life, a woman cannot keep on taking no, sir, sir, uh, I, just, sir, I want to interrupt here, sir. Uh, I think we can advise at least taking once a week, not even not regularly, hmm. but what, you know, according to I mean, Anemia Mukta Bharat program, we can at least advise them in the reproductive age at least once a week. So for all so, government colleges, government schools, they are giving uh, iron tablets. But at least for our patients, we can advise once a week tablet. I think everybody will uh, take it. So this that... Is it was very interesting. In 2003, an article was published from Nepal. <clears throat> that was weekly iron versus daily iron. 14 weeks, 14 tablets versus 100 tablets, which was our ICMR protocol. And they found that the correction of uh, anemia was similar in both of them. So obviously, people started saying this is from Nepal, not a, a good uh, way to conduct a trial. They conducted similar trials in US. They found the similar results. This was for adolescent age. Then in Gujarat, in the uh, area called Panchmahal, where um, many Adivasis stay, 
there they found even in pregnant women a similar outcome so i personally feel that a protocol may be designed to reduce overall iron load and still get away with it because when we load iron to women 30% of them have gi symptoms and their overall nutrition gets affected so if we give a weekly iron for those who have good hemoglobin that is sufficient those who are in mild anemia group twice a week this is how i am practicing in my own private practice since last 18 years i believe that government hospitals is a different ball game and where we find many people with lot of reduced uh, hemoglobin but in private practice to be honest in last 18 years i have given just one ivi okay and almost very rarely i have given daily iron i got away with it twice a week and once a week so over and second uh, dr priti option which i have in fact tried mm. with icmr also is that we provide cast iron utensils to this families and they cook one wet meal that is either rice or uh, dal not the chapatis so wet meal will get sufficient iron which leaches from the metal i mean the utensil to the food and entire family gets sufficient iron for their life in india before 1940 1950 iron deficiency was not this much after the advent of stainless steel hindalium non sticks and all this our natural source of iron which was the utensil has gone you all know that jaggery has lot of iron why because it is prepared in the iron utensil and iron leaches into it the mild steel is not good because mild steel which we use the thinner tawi that makes food rancid when oil comes in contact with iron and that is why the taste changes and people feel uncomfortable with that but cast iron utensils would work and in fact i have proposed a project with uh, icmr the three villages i would take up 100 families i'll give only the utensils and 100 families would take the regular iron tablets so these are certain issues which i feel we need to think in a larger perspective that we cannot tell them that for life you keep on taking iron tablets we need to find other solutions and acog american college in fact american medical association has advised all their vegans that they should cook their food at least one meal in a cast iron utensil that will give them sufficient iron for the family not one person the entire family gets and there is another element to this look at the gender issue because myself my wife and two daughters we eat across the same table and still consistently my hemoglobin is 5 g plus we eat the same food and why is it so so gender issue is also there of course menstruation does have a, a loss of iron but it can't make a difference of 5 g of hemoglobin so women are basically having lesser hemoglobin we can't categorize them as uh, disease women okay so we need to redefine the definition of anemia for our setup and for that we need to conduct some trials conduct uh, group comparisons that what we call as anemia say from 8 to 10 or 9 to 11 are they really having any trouble in their life if not why do we import the definitions of western world and continue with it so these are just few uh, thoughts which i thought i'll share with you all because i have been debating on this since many years since i was a student But i have always been fox yes i'm pretty so i just wanted to uh, say that you know there are different geographical conditions the situations are different like kerala has a different situation if i talk about up it's totally you know worse than any other state so where i think there is a definite because i i visited so many cscs during my project of maybe anemia or maybe pph so there are certain you know, cscs at the nepal border where you know hemoglobin is maybe 7 or 8 grams in pregnant women and they they don't have the blood storage units where i think an iv iron is the only way they have 
it, they only give iron and sucrose to these patients and they make it hemoglobin to up to 10 and they consider 10 as normal and they deliver those patients because the district hospitals from that CSC is almost, you know, they have to cross a hundred kilometers. That's a jungle. So there are so many, you know, this, these all forms the aspirational districts. So there I think is definitely role of IV iron and uh, we must, you know, uh, you know, categorize which patients I, I totally agree. You cannot force any any person to take iron lifetime but definitely uh, as you can see there is so much knowledge practice gaps in our own OBGYNs but for pregnant women we have to target hemoglobin more than uh, 11 anyways maybe because you need to re reduce the maternal and uh, this thing and definitely uh, the other lifestyle which you have for, told definitely iron utensils these are important and uh, we should you know incorporate so sir I've, I have also applied this time for ICMR project uh, um, just submitted the project. We are going to take a Sitapur district for iron and we, we consider two blocks as for non-intervention group and two blocks for the intervention group and then we will compare. So I don't know whether this project will be accepted, but we have submitted this project this time. Thank you, Dr. Parul, Dr. Prithi. Yeah. Very good and unique insight. Mm -hmm. And India is a country where there is so much diversity. Mm -hmm. Even 100 so, kilometers distance, you can find so much difference in cultural practices, cooking practices, which Dr. Parul has highlighted. Yes, sir, please go ahead. But no, so sir, I was that shocked to see that the... NHS 5 data in Gujarat shows a decline in any. So the anemia has <laughs> no, risen in there. So agree, almost agree. there is a 7 to 8 points difference. in uh, It has risen in uh, Gujarat. So I was surprised to see Gujarat as, you know, a uh, 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 state where the anemia is rising. See, Gujarat has a significant tribal population. And amongst them, sickle cell is also prevalent. Secondly, we are adjoining Pakistan and we have significant uh, carriers of thalassemia also. So that also contributes uh, in certain way. Now, my take was government has to make uh, guidelines. Okay, they may make um, stringent things that this is how we go. But then they would revise after 10 years, this doesn't work and all those things. What we are looking as clinician is individualize the patient. And that is where I uh, was mentioning that our role comes as an individual patient. That this patient having a normal hemoglobin doesn't require a lot of iron. Otherwise, her routine nutrition may also get affected. See, why I'm saying this is we have been trained. When I was a student, we were trained three times a day iron. Because every eight hour the gut has to be loaded continuously with iron so that optimum absorption occurs. But then we never reckoned with the side issues, which were the, the sequelae of uh, overloading uh, the iron. Then we realized that those studies, as I said, the Nepal study was really eye-opener. And obviously, there were so much criticism that Nepal people cannot do genuine studies and all those. But then when they tried to replicate, they realized that that was genuine and similar data is emerging in other studies as well. So significant numbers, say let, let us say 30% have normal hemo. Why should we load them with iron? Government would say yeah, every woman, pregnant woman should be given iron once a day. There we can reduce once a week, maybe enough. And the lady would easily we take can low dose, sir. low dose iron also can be preferred in these true so i tell my patients that look in a month you will take only four iron tablets she happily takes but if i take them tell them we go to take 30 tablets after 15 days she stops okay this is a general perception my my own perception but you also observe and you may also feel this so 50% of women may need good support of iron, but 50% where we can individualize and reduce the load for that overall in, uh, nutrition. So, so even, if you write, they don't of, it. So even if you write it, they don't, they don't take it. It's the era of personalized <laughs> medicine. Charmila has something to say, and there are a yeah. couple of questions for Charmila, actually. Yeah. I think we'll take them here. The first one yeah. is from Dr. Uri no, no. Kothari from before, Pune. Before that, that anemia thing, I'll just say. I never yeah, took iron, iron during my pregnancy. I never landed See. up with anemia. <laughs> <laughs> you come from a different iron. class. That's and, all we can say. And I delivered at 7 gram percent. No, I didn't. Uh -huh. I was 11, gram. I was 11 throughout 11 even gram. in spite of not taking iron. So I was quite But Preeti, you were taking but, iron? Regular. So I was taking iron, but still <laughs> hemoglobin was 7 to 8 gram percent. And Dr. Chandra, so right here you can see 
ट्रॉपिकल कंट्रीज एंड वी हैव टू कीप इन माइंड द इन्फेस्टेशन एंड इन्फेक्शन okay the malaria the bumps and uh, the chronic uti repeated uti and fourth is uh, poor water water also carries lot many amoebas and such things and that also leads to chronic gi problems and that leads to poor so, absorption okay so this we have to keep in mind especially when we come across a severely anemic woman we should rule this out treat this and then only start with iron otherwise iron will exacerbate her gi mm. symptoms mm. and it may be counter product yes yes sir. i think we covered that in the beginning of our talk we'll take we'll take these couple of uh, relevant sir, questions that have come in dr priti about the a letter clear about the thalassemia screening routinely in pregnancy or not not routinely not it is not in the guidelines that, that you should routine but once you are giving iron the patient is not responding you should after one month screen for erythalysemia and okay. i i just told you how just looking at the simple blood picture you can make out whether patient is having a thalassemia like i showed the hemoglobin was 8 and still the counts were normal and still the mcv was reduced so those patients can you can just screen those patients and have you know idea whether this patient can have thalassemia what about hb electrophoresis for each patient we have to do no 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 i just now mentioned it if you know it, it is very difficult to screen each and every patient if you a patient is not responding your to the oral iron then after one month's time you have to screen or if you seeing the general blood picture or seeing the rbc indices and you find that, that there is a disparity then you can you know go ahead with the uh, i i showed you one uh, blood yeah, picture yeah. report yeah, yeah. 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 yes the sindhis and bhatia communities have very high prevalence of thalassemia we have conducted school level assessment also but in those pe- people if they have not already been screened we should screen them 5% is the prevalence in sindhi community and bhatia community thank you sir dr uh, tarbila if you are there yeah. then we can take these couple of questions which have come in dr urvi yeah. kotari from pune is asking is there any role of iv alanine and arginine for treatment of fetal growth system there's no accepted uh, that is no guideline is there it is all like uh, if you want to satisfy yourself on the patient you try it out how much it's it empirical works empirical therapy uh, empirical it's empirical placebo also may be helpful uh, and there's one more question from dr harsha jain she is from delhi and she's asking can we avoid severe iugr in the next pregnancy uh, you can in, to a certain extent if you can screen the mother for all the risk factors suppose she has got diabetes with a vascular problem hypertension and any other metabolic disease or uh, uh, apla syndrome renal disease all that you can screen make sure that she is optimally controlled before she becomes pregnant and a person has got a preeclampsia is going to have problems with the placenta in the next pregnancies also so you would rather like kind of screen totally and uh, uh, bmi lifestyle all that has to be changed before she becomes pregnant during a pregnancy start her on aspirin as early as possible because aspirin has got a fa- even though it is not proved yet we have seen that it helps in both growth restriction as well as preeclampsia mothers so you can consider giving the aspirin from early gestation as well as calcium also keep make sure that calcium levels calcium she is taking it adequately along with vitamin d all this you can control and have a early screening protocol for them screen them early so that you pick them up early so that the optimum treatment can be done for the baby other so than that there is nothing 
chronic disease, NCDs, and recurrent issues are the ones which we are looking at. And, and as you said rightly, on, on, under the table, sometimes we give heparin. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it may not be possible to predict fetal growth restriction. The patients yeah, where you least expect it, it does happen. And it can happen either in the early stages of pregnancy, where it is much more difficult to deal with, or it can be a late third trimester presentation as well, which you covered very beautifully in your talk. And when we land invite... up with that, you know, when we land up with the stillbirth, it is one of the catastrophic, which can catastrophic thing you can ma can very difficult to manage a patient in the attenders when you have a late uh, FGR with a stillbirth. So that's why you have to be careful for all your so-called low risk mothers. Absolutely. So we have over one thousand two hundred viewers who are logged in to today's program. I think both the speakers did a fantastic job. Before I present the formal vote of thanks, if anybody has anything to say, please feel free to speak. And then I will present the final vote of thanks to Dr. Shanta. Uh, can Dr. I ask Casey? Parul sir? I can I ask Parul sir one more question? Sir, do you yeah. think it's mandatory that we do a late third trimester scan for all our mothers? Because yes, we stop at 34 weeks and then we don't do it again. Should we should we do another scan at after 36 weeks? If I can respond to that question, yes, I've been yes. doing it since the 1990s. Okay. So that is part of my standard practice since I was an undergraduate and postgraduate student. But let Dr. Parul take it. No, I mean, in my practice, I do uh, get one scan at 36 weeks. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I think the main question arises where we are practicing in an NHS-like environment where the government is paying for it and then they look need to look at cost effectiveness and cost benefit ratio analysis, all those figures. In private practice, I think all of us do it. And in most of the tertiary care institutions as well, I'm sure Priti will agree with me, most medical colleges also we do it. No, but off late, one curious thing is happening. Patients are demanding, sir, why are you not doing frequent ultrasound? Please get it done. We want to see the baby. We want to see the heart weights. That kind of a curious thing is happening. I mean, uh, I do tell them that it is meaningless. I mean, why do you want to undergo that? So maybe we need to increase the charges of uh, ultrasound scan. Ultrasound. Then only <laughs> it will have a salutary effect. <laughs> we do it at much cheaper rate. See, yeah. in USA, an ultrasound scan is $800. Okay. And we do it at a throwaway price, and that is why. Dr. Preeti, Dr. Shanta, any concluding remarks before uh, we close the program? Actually, there are no questions, but uh, the both sessions really were very, very good. And uh, a detailed analysis of each and every point, especially the FGR, early and late. Uh, it is the day-to-day -day practice uh, point and each and every obstetrician and gynecologist, they need the information about the how to detect early and how to detect late and the implications of both and how to diagnose and what to do if FGR is found. Very, very elaborative sessions both speakers have given to us and we are thankful to them. Just was Thank last you. last comment and uh, Pratik, that's important because uh, when we did this survey, we found that 50% of the VGYNs are not testing for ferritin, not, you know, confirming the iron deficiency and they're giving IVRN. So that's the only, you know, take home message that please confirm that's the iron deficiency anemia. Maybe sometimes you may be overloading with the iron in a thalassemic patient. So that's very, very important. If it is possible, screen for thalassemia. You never know. But if it is not possible, just looking at the blood picture, you can have an idea. And then uh, definitely iron deficiency anemia should be a top priority for a country. In, like in Foxians also, it should be on a top priority. That's that's very important. Thank you, Dr. Preeti. So it's my privilege to present the final vote of thanks at the end of today's event. Thank you for being logged into Puyoji's experience series. Today, we had two fantastic speakers in the shape of Dr. Charmila and Dr. Preeti, who deliberated on PT growth restriction and management of anemia with parental lines, respectively. My gratitude to our two chairpersons, Dr. Parul Dagala, our chairperson elect of ICOG, and Dr. Shanta Durge, who is a chairperson with Prasuka. Thank you, both of you, for gracing the occasion and actively participating in the proceedings as well. 
my thanks to our back end team science integra subhu and shrutika who is here for being our scientific backbone i also need to place on record my gratitude to our academic partners glisten who are the makers of injection i3 iv mag which is magnesium sulfate for eclampsia as well as for the neuro protection and carbitocin which is carbocin room stable uh, room temperature stable which has revolutionized the prevention of tph in our country thank you dr shanta and thank you dr parul for being with us thank you audience who has logged in from across the country over 1200 of you it's always a pleasure and a privilege to be with all these distinguished luminaries of popsi and icog until the next time we look forward to seeing you goodbye god bless bye from thank, thank you sir thank you thank you sir bye and bye. thank you the speakers yeah. yeah tech support please go offline